Friends, good morning, and may the peace of Christ be with you today. Uh, We here at City Church are a historically rooted and spiritually diverse Christian community. And as you're worshiping with us this morning, uh, I want to invite you to get in touch with us. Check us out on the web at citychurchftl.com slash welcome. Before we jump in, though, hear this call to worship based on Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Pray with me. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his life, death, and resurrection. Uh, Go before us this morning in the power of your Holy Spirit and draw us into your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
As we gather together, we have an opportunity to confess together, and we are called into confession with these words from Isaiah 30. In repentance and in rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. We'll confess together, and then I'll give you some time to confess silently. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom of intellect and reason and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we confess the way we sinned against you and against one another. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, for his work on earth was done. On the cross at Calvary, where he hung there on a tree for my sin. The good news of the gospel is this I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. Our sermon text today comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in, in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, and so he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. And yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, said the father, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad 
because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. It's been just over two weeks since the Atlanta Braves won the Baseball World Series against the Houston Astros. That's a pretty special thing to me. While the rest of the country has lamented the really boring nature and the length of baseball games, I've leaned in to the slow pace and I've followed the Braves pretty closely for several years. It's the team I grew up cheering on when I was young. And though I knew they were good, I can't believe that they won it all this year. And when I say I follow them closely, I don't think you quite understand me. This year, out of 162 games, I either watched or listened to most or mostly all, of about 158 of those games. I was invested. My mood would soar with a win and crash with a loss. So when it came to the final series and the eventual win, I felt relief. It was so weird. I was excited and I jumped around a bit, gave some high fives, but I still felt more of a sense of relief, like it was hard to celebrate. And it made me think a lot about how we do celebrations in our culture. So much of South Florida lives in a state of perpetual celebration. There's a party somewhere every day, which means if you're celebrating everything, then you're not really celebrating anything. I mean, many of us overlook real moments of celebration because there's the next thing to get to. There's another party, another person, another team, another goal to focus on, and we don't stop and celebrate in the moment. It's almost like we've forgotten how. It's almost like we don't know that we were made for celebration. In the beginning of Luke 15, we're introduced to two groups of people. So the very first part of the chapter, there's the tax collectors and sinners. These are the people who have left a more traditional morality of society. These were the people who broke all the rules. But then they had this other group made up of Pharisees and teachers of the law. Within a first century Jewish context, these were the religious leaders who held to a traditional morality. These were the people who kept all the rules. And here in Luke 15, the religious leaders had noticed something, that Jesus seems to attract and befriend tax collectors and sinners, one group, all the rule breakers. And we read in Luke 15 too that they mutter to one another about this. We can almost imagine them saying, ha, look at him, you welcome sinners. This must be because he just tells them everything they want to hear and he's not really calling them to change. So when Jesus overhears their muttering, he doesn't respond to them directly, but instead he responds with three stories that challenge the Pharisees and expose their hearts. By listening carefully to all three parables, especially to the last one, traditionally called the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus challenges his listeners' fundamental assumptions about God, sin, salvation, and even the kinds of things that are worth celebrating. So in Luke 15, verses four through seven, Jesus tells a story of a lost sheep and a a shepherd who leaves all the others to go find the one lost sheep. The sheep is lost because of its nature. It's kind of dumb, just wanders off and doesn't know how to get back. But next, in the second parable in Luke 15, eight through 10, there's a story about a woman with 10 coins and she loses one. Now, unlike the lost sheep, the coin isn't lost because of something it had done. It was lost because it had been mismanaged. The three lost objects, the sheep, the coin, and in our text today from verses 11 through 32, the son, all represent people who are spiritually lost and far from God. This is Jesus characterizing the people the Pharisees viewed as sinners. They're lost, and yet they're lost in quite different ways. The the sheep is lost through its foolishness, the coin is lost through thoughtlessness, and the son is lost through willfulness. Taken together, this is a really complex view of how we all get lost. Think about a person who is dealing with the problem of anger. Maybe he flies off the handle and is sometimes verbally abusive or physically abusive. And so the question is, is his problem genetic? Is it a matter of brain chemistry or just part of his inborn nature as as like the sheep? Or is his problem the result of a bad environment, perhaps the result of poor parenting and family life? Was he like the coin mismanaged by people who were supposed to care for him? Or does his problem stem from selfishness and pride as with the younger prodigal son? 
The answer is that usually, in varying degrees, it's all the above. Because sin is deeply complex. It's inborn in you, it's magnified by sinful treatment, and it's deepened and shaped by your own choices. When we get to the longest and most famous of the three stories in our text today, we have to keep in mind that Jesus was telling this story to first century Jewish people, not 21st century parents of Gen Z teenagers. So in verses 11 and 12, it says that there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so the father divided his property between them. See, in this context, the younger son's request was stunning because of the inheritance, of course. It wasn't divided up uh, and distributed to the children until the father died. As Kenneth Bailey writes, in Middle Eastern culture, to ask for the inheritance while the father is alive is to wish him dead. The word here for property is bios. It literally means his life. And so the request would therefore have been to disgrace the family name because the younger son's extraordinary disrespect for the father. It would have also been a blow to the economic standing of the family, since the father would have to sell parts of the estate in order to give him his share. In short, this request ripped the family apart. It was a relational and economic act of violence against the family's integrity. The younger son may have lived with his father and may have even obeyed his father, but he didn't love his father. The thing he loved ultimately was the father's things, not the father. His heart was set on wealth and on comfort, freedom and status that wealth brings. His father was just a means to an end. He didn't care about the pain that he brought to the father. The younger son's request to the father would have shocked Jesus' listeners, but the father's response is even more remarkable. This was a patriarchal society in which you were required to show deference and reference toward those who are older and above you, especially parents. This kind of contempt and insolence would have ordinarily been met with outrage. The listeners would expect the father to explode and probably drive the son out with beatings. But the father, he's being asked to tear his life apart, and he does. We read the simple words in Luke 15, 12, so he divided his property between them. The older son and anyone else in the community would have thought that if father was being foolish to give in to the younger son's request. But by bearing the pain of the son's sin himself instead of taking revenge, the father kept the door open for a relationship. The father was willing to suffer for the sin of the child so that someday reconciliation would be possible. And this is what we see play out. In the story, the son goes off, lives a life that spirals into destruction and regret, and we see a change of heart. In verse 17, it says, And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out, go back to my father, and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. See, the son's plan was to try to reconcile by earning his way back. But in verse 20 through 24, we see the father's response. It says that while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, this is his I'm sorry speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father stops him and he says, to the servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found, and so they began to celebrate. In what would have been a complete surprise to the listener, the father doesn't wait for the debt to be paid or for the son to grovel. He doesn't let him take the path of earning his way back, but he covers his son's poverty and rags with robes of honor and throws a feast in his honor. That's undeserved grace. And it seems that this is where the story should end, right? I mean, it fits nicely with all the other stories of lostness, things lost, now found. But almost half the story, the rest of the story, is now directed at the older brother, the one who stayed around the one who did the right thing and honored the father by following the rules and working hard. 
Act one tells us about free grace, but act two tells us how costly the grace was. It's not a short epilogue on having a bad attitude. This is a story uh, will now redefine how we see lostness. So verses 25 through 30, meanwhile, the older son was in the field and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brothers come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father came out, pleaded with him, and he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, and yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you, you kill the fattened calf for him. See, we see that this is the day that the father has been waiting for for so long. So the response is extravagant. The food, the ring, the robe, it's an epic celebration. But notice the elder brother's response. He's angry, he refuses to go in, which again would have been incredibly disrespectful. The father goes out, he pleads with him to come in, and the older brother responds even more harshly, with even more disrespect. He points out all that he has done compared with all that the younger brother has done. He's angry because this party is coming out of his share of the inheritance. Earlier, we saw that the younger brother is lost and he left home and broke the rules. He wanted the father's things, but not the father. But at the end of this thing, it becomes evident that the elder brother also wanted selfish control of the father's wealth. He was very unhappy with the father's use of his possessions, the robe, the ring, the calf. But while the younger brother tried to get control by taking his stuff and running away, we see that the older brother tries to get control by staying home and being very good. He feels that now he has the right to tell the father what to do with his possessions because he's followed the rules. I've done the right thing, you owe me. Jesus is actually saying that there are two ways that you can be your own savior or attempt to be. One is by defying the rules and making your own and the other is by keeping all the rules and being very good. See, the culture tells us the same thing, that you can find happiness by one of two ways, either by moral conformity or by self-discovery. Usually either way, we're looking for a way to build our own identity. But the difference between a religious person and a gospel person is that a religious person thinks, if I obey God, God will love me and have to bless me. And a gospel Christian knows this, God loves me and blesses me by free grace because of Jesus Christ. And therefore, my response is obedience. So to be clear, Jesus isn't saying that the behavior of the younger is fine, nor is Jesus saying obeying is wrong. If you break all the rules, there's pretty often a good evidence of your brokenness. But Jesus was actually warning that if you're an older brother type, that you're more spiritual, that's actually a more spiritually dangerous condition because your lostness is covered in goodness. But underneath, you believe that God owes you. And there's often a lack of joy and assurance in God's love and a coldness to those who haven't performed as well as you. Richard Lovelace puts it this way. People who are no longer sure that God loves and accepts them in Jesus, apart from their present spiritual achievements, are subconsciously, radically insecure persons. Their insecurity shows itself in pride, a fierce defensive assertion of their own righteousness, and a defensive criticism of others. They come naturally to hate other cultural styles or other races in order to bolster their own security and discharge their suppressed anger. See, Jesus wants us to see that the gospel of grace is different altogether. The older brother divides the world into two and says the good people like us are in and the bad people, the reason the world's messed up, they're out. And the younger brother does the same thing and says, no, 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 open-minded and tolerant are in and the bigoted and narrow-minded people, that's the reason the world is messed up, they're out. And the gospel says everyone's wrong, everyone is loved, and everyone's called to recognize this and change. The story is told that the Times of London at one point early in the 1900s posed this question to several prominent authors. What's wrong with the world today? The well-known author G.K. Chesterton is said to have responded with this one sentence essay. Dear sir, I am. Yours, G.K. Chesterton. 
Jesus makes it clear that no matter who we more identify with in the story, we are all spiritually lost because of our sin and we've been alienated from the Father. So what we need are for things to be made right and if we become aware of the alienation from God, we will naturally want to earn our way back. See, most people think of religion as humanity's search for God. We like to think of ourselves as spiritual seekers, honest inquirers. We look at religion, all religions of the world, and while giving somewhat different directions about how to do so, they all seem to agree that if we sincerely search for God, we'll find him. But the gospel turns this idea on its head. See, in these three stories, there are hints of Jesus fulfilling what we really need. See, the shepherd in the first story is someone who Jesus obviously identifies with the shepherd needs to go out and seek and save that which is lost. The coin cannot search and find its owner. The owner has to go get the coin. And the younger brother, what he needed was a true older brother to seek him out. All of these point to the gospel. Jesus went to the cross in weakness, and there voluntarily his life was torn apart. But he did it so that when we repent, like the younger son, forgiveness and reconciliation with God, well, it's available. On the cross, instead of blasting his enemies, he lovingly took the penalty for their sin and ours on himself. We were so sinful that he had to die, die for us, but we were so loved that he was willing to die for us. But notice, though the theme in Luke 15 is of lost things being found, there's another theme that runs through these stories. It's the response to the restoration. In response to the lost sheep being found, it says in Luke 15, seven, then the shepherd called his friends and neighbors together and said, rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. In response to the lost coin in Luke 15, nine, it says, and this woman, when she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And in response to the lost son being found in Luke 15, 32, the father says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. This is about a God who celebrates. He celebrates when those who are spiritually wandering find a home. He celebrates when those who are hurting find healing. He celebrates when those fighting against his love finally see the Father's embrace. He even celebrates when the cold-hearted older brother see that they need grace too. This is about lost things being found. It's about broken people restored. It's about redemption and renewal. You see, every significant celebration in our lives is about people and things that are important to us, but all of them are ultimately pointing to God's deep celebration. When we celebrate a win, it's a celebration of victory and overcoming. When we celebrate a birthday, it's about life. When we celebrate an anniversary, it's about a sustained relationship. All of our celebration is tied into the cosmic celebration of God, who will one day, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, make all things new. Every sad thing will come untrue and every good thing will be restored. We have to celebrate. What's been lost is now being found. Let's pray. God, thank you that you don't leave it to us to find ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Help us to see our own lostness. Help us to see the ways in which you have gone as our true older brother, the one we needed to go out and seek us, to save us, to rescue us from darkness and bring us to the light of your son. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as we have heard this good news, let us take a minute and affirm our faith together. Let's affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this online Worship at Home resource. If you would like to connect with us in any way or to find out more about City Church or even to give to the mission and vision of this church, you can go to our website at citychurchftl.com. And so as we leave today, receive this blessing. May God our Father, the giver of all things, make us faithful stewards of his gifts to the glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with him and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.